everyone. Welcome to the week of September 28th through October the 2nd. So last week we started working on um, doing inferences with social studies and we spent a lot of time talking about voter rights and how voter rights evolved over American history to what we see today. So this week what we're going to talk about is modern voter suppression. We're still going to be talking about making inferences, but we're going to apply it to today. So what you want to do is make sure you have a, a pen and pencil and your paper or notebook so we can take notes as we go along. So the first thing we want to talk about is who is affected by voter suppression. We know that this word suppression has to do with suppress. And when we talk about suppress, it means to push down or to put something down. So the short answer is, is that every single person is affected by voter suppression because everyone in the United States has a right to vote. But the important thing to remember is that some groups are disproportionately affected. So we wanna break down this word disproportion. So when I look at this, I see the prefix dis, I see a suffix, eight and I see a suffix ly. I also see the root word proportion. So I know that this word proportion talks about how things are related together. Um, and if something is proportional, it means that it makes sense. It's to scale. I know that dis means not. So disproportion means not proportionately affected. So it means that the scales are a little bit out of whack. So what we mean when we talk about voter suppression, it means that people of color, young people, the elderly, and people with disabilities are more likely to uh, come in contact with voter suppression or they're more likely to see the results of voter suppression affect them. So on this next slide, you don't really have to write any of these down, but I just wanted to share with you some statistics about voter suppression just to kind of share with you who actively is uh, being targeted by voter suppression. So we are going to talk about voter purges in just a minute, but what we see is that 70% of Georgia's voters that were purged from their records in 2018 were black. Across the country, one in 13 black Americans cannot vote due to what are called disenfranchisement laws. So this is another type of voter suppression that we're going to talk about. One third of voters who have a disability report difficulty voting, which is a huge number. Only 40% of polling places fully accommodate for people with disabilities. And these can be any kind of disabilities, ranging from hearing issues to sight issues to physical disabilities, anything that um, requires you to have an accommodation. What we're seeing is that only 40% of places can actively be of assistance. That means that 60% of other polling places make it harder for you to vote if you have a disability. We see that across the country, Counties with larger minority populations have fewer polling sites and poll workers per voter. So this is something that I saw growing up uh, in Detroit. So I grew up in a very white suburb of Detroit called Sterling Heights, and there were lots of places to vote and lots of people to work the polls. But in Detroit, that wasn't the case. We saw a lot fewer polling places and there were less people to actively work at those polling places. And lastly, lastly, we see that six in 10 college students come from out of state in New Hampshire, and yet the state was trying to block residents with out of state driver's licenses from voting. So this is something that really affects young people that are attending college. So we're going to talk about a couple of different uh, voter suppression tactics and how they work and what you can do to kind of stop those tactics. So the first that we're going to talk about are voter ID laws. So voter ID laws are just laws that ask voters to show a government ID to vote. Now, on its surface, this doesn't necessarily sound like a bad thing until we talk about some numbers. In the United States, 11% of citizens do not have government IDs. So this comes out to being close to 21 million people, which is quite a lot of people that, if they don't have their IDs, are not able to vote. So this is an example where people are given the right to vote, but not the ability to vote. 
Voter ID laws just make it a little bit harder for you to actually vote. So in Kentucky, our voter ID laws ask that you have your ID when you go and vote. So this is something that you're going to want to remember if you're going out to the polls pretty soon. Our requirements say that you have to have a Kentucky government ID, which is your driver's license. You can have a United States government issued ID, which is something like your passport. You can have a college, university, technical, or professional school ID. So if you're going to school, you have that ID. Or you can have a city, county, or local government ID. So if you don't drive, those are the IDs that you would most likely have. So why are these really a problem? Why are voter IDs ID laws really a bad thing? So the first problem is that minority voters are disproportionately lacking in ID. So here's that word disproportionately again, meaning that um, if you are a voter of color or in a minority group, it means that you are less likely to have uh, your ID in order than uh, someone who is white. We also see that states are excluding forms of ID in a discriminatory fanner, manner, meaning that we are picking and choosing which forms of ID to accept. So for example, Texas allows concealed weapon permits as ID for voting, but it won't accept a student ID card. So they're being discriminatory in which types of ID they can accept. Another way that we see voter IDs laws as being discriminatory is how they're enforced. So when we talk about enforcement of something, it just means how laws are actively being used. So what happens is that minority voters are asked for their ID more frequently than white voters. This is something that sounds really similar to what we had talked about last week when we talk about literacy tests. Even though they're applicable to everyone, we said that if you were a white voter, you would pass your literacy test. The same thing is kind of happening here, that the enforcement of these laws is actually how they're discriminatory. And what happens as a result is that this actually just reduces voter, voter turnout. And as we talked a little bit about last week, um, the majority of population in 2016 just didn't come out and vote. So anything that reduces turnout is in essentially a bad thing. The second type of voter suppression that we want to talk about is voter registration restrictions. So again, we talked a little bit about this last week where we had said that it doesn't seem quite fair to restrict the amount of time you're able to register to vote. And what ends up happening is that, again, these on their surface don't sound like a bad thing, but what we see is that things are very outdated. So I want to first look at this example with this quote up at the top. In the 2016 presidential election, over 90,000 New Yorkers were unable to vote because their applications didn't meet the cutoff date, and the state had the eight worst turnout rate in the country. And this comes from the ACLU, which is the American Civil Liberties Union, which is an organization that fights for your rights, um, not just your right to vote, but other rights as well. And what this kind of tells me is that that group of people, those 90,000 New Yorkers, fit into that category where they were just unable to vote. Um, and it's really because of a an outdated restriction rule. So right now, registration restrictions on registrations on when you register make it harder for you to vote. So some of them require citizenship documents. So for example, you might need your birth certificate, but if that's not something you have access to, you'd have to pay for it. Uh, there are penalties for voter registration drives. So a registration drive is just when a group of people get together and try to get as many people as possible registered to vote. It doesn't matter for what party, they just want you voting. And the other problem is that there, it's limiting the window of time that voters can actively register. So I am a huge procrastinator and I make myself a lot of lists so that I stay on top of the things that I need to do. And due dates for me can be really hard because if I don't really put them into my calendar or if I don't write them down, I will miss them. So making sure that all of these restrictions are in place really limits our vote ability to vote. So most of these restrictions date back to when everything needed to be done on paper and pencil and you had to mail everything in. But now we have the internet, which makes it faster and easier for you to register to vote. So I want you to think for a minute and I want you to make an inference. Imagine that you are a new voter 
which would be easier for you as a new voter? Registering the same day that you have to vote or having a deadline the month before the election? I want you to pause the video and kind of think this through. I personally, making all of my inferences, think it would be easier to have same day registration because if it's my first time voting, I may not know exactly what I'm doing or where I'm going or how it works. So not having to worry about registering beforehand would make it a lot easier for me to vote. So the next thing we're going to talk about are voter purges. So voter purges are actually um, good things, but not all the time. So when you clean up vo voter rolls, that is just part of being a responsible election administration, because we know that people move out of state, people die, and sometimes you become ineligible to vote. So it's important to make sure that we are cleaning up your voter rolls to make sure that everything is consistent. But the problem is, is that our rules aren't being enforced consistently from state to state. So sometimes a state uses this process to purge eligible voters, meaning that you can vote, from the rolls for illegitimate reasons or be based off of bad data. So it's important to make sure that you are registered to vote because voters don't have to be informed if they've been purged from a record. So that means if you show up to vote on election day um, and someone says to you, well, you've been purged from the records, you have no way of knowing that because you are not told that you have been purged from a record. So what we see is that even though this is a necessary part of running an election, it's being used in, a, in an illegal fashion. So I want to look at this quote down here. A recent Brennan Center study found that almost 16 million voters were purged from the rolls between 2014 and 2016, and that jurisdictions with a history of racial discrimination had significantly higher purge rates. So based off of this quote here, let's make an inference. What does this mean to me? What does this mean to the United States as a whole? Pause the video, and, and I want you to think of your answer. So when I read this, there are a couple of things that stand out to me. So the first is that since this was between 2014 and 2016, I know this happens right before the 2016 uh, presidential elections. And I'm also seeing that a lot of this happened in jurisdictions or areas with a history of racial discrimination. So that to me makes me think of the South where we see a lot of Jim Crow era laws that were um, suppressing the right of African Americans. So I'm kind of seeing that this is tied to some of the things we talked about last week where we have uh, different groups of people trying to take away the vote of African Americans. So this is another tactic that can happen to anyone. It doesn't matter who you are. You, everyone has the possibility of being purged from the records. So the next thing that we want to talk about is felony disenfranchisement. So this is a really great word again to break down. We see dis, which means not, enfranchise, and then mint. So we know dis is not. Enfranchise means to give someone the ability to do something. So when you have disenfranchisement, it means that you are having the ability to do something taken away from you. And this has to do a lot if someone has gone to jail or prison for whatever reason after they get out of jail or prison. There are different laws in different states that say you either get your voting rights back or you don't or maybe you never lost them in the first place. So different states have different laws which makes it really confusing. And the reason that I want to talk about this, this is really important, is because a lot of the problems with felony disenfranchisement are rooted in racial practices. So I want to look at this quote here. Due to racial bias, which means that you have a prejudice against a group of people based off of their race, so due to racial bias in the criminal justice system, felony disenfranchisement laws disproportionately, there's that word again, affect black people who often face harsher sentences than white people for the same offenses. Meaning that if a black person and a white person are to commit the same crime, it is more likely that the black person will have a harsher penalty than the white person will. And this is something that we still see in existence today. This isn't old. It may sound old, but it is something that we are still dealing with and still fighting today. So I want to continue this quote. 
It should come as no surprise that many of these laws are rooted in the Jim Crow era, which we talked about, where we talk about voter suppression. When legislators tried to block back Black Americans' newly won right to vote by enforcing poll taxes, literacy tests, and other barriers that were nearly impossible to meet. This is another example of what we would call another barrier. We are setting up this barrier as a country, and what it means is that we have many, 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 many people that are just not able to vote anymore. So Kentucky's law specifically says that all people with felony convictions are permanently disenfranchised, meaning that uh, in Kentucky, if you are a felon or if you've been to jail or prison, you no longer have the right to vote. That vote, that right has been taken from you. So I want to take a minute and look at this chart here. This comes from the ACLU, <clears throat> which is where I'm getting a lot of my information today. And what I'm seeing here is that all of these states have tremendously different rules. The, the, the amount of colors that I see on this graph tells me that there isn't a consistent rule across states. There isn't a consistent rule across regions. And everything varies from state to state. So Kentucky is one of the few states where if you have a felony record or a felony conviction, your right to vote is just removed as a whole. Only two other states have that, Iowa and Virginia. So there are only very, very few that actually have that problem. And then when we look at this light green area, everyone has the right to vote, no matter what, regardless of your conviction status. And there's actually only two two states that do that, Maine and New Hampshire. So we want to keep in mind that because this is different in every single state, it makes it really hard to make consistent rules and vote consistently. But it also means that a large portion of the African American community is not able to vote, and it's a permanent thing. This is not able to vote for your entire life in some places. So this is something that really um, mirrors a lot of the tactics that we saw during the Jim Crow era to make sure that people could not vote. So the next thing we want to talk about is gerrymandering. So gerrymandering is a little bit complex. So what I want to do is I want to watch this video here to help us understand what gerrymandering is. Most people have heard the word gerrymandering once or twice, probably during a presidential election. What exactly is gerrymandering? Essentially, it's the process of giving one political party an advantage over another political party by redrawing district lines. It's like Democrats trying to gain an advantage over Republicans, or Republicans trying to gain an advantage over Democrats. You see, each party wants to gain as many districts as possible so they can do things like control the state budget or set themselves up to win even more districts in the future. So, to understand how this process began and how it continues today, we must go back to 1812 in Massachusetts. Elbridge Gerry, the governor of Massachusetts, supported and signed a bill to allow redistricting, that is, redrawing the boundaries that separate districts. The catch? The new lines would favor Jerry's own political party, the Democratic Republican Party, which no longer exists. You see, Jerry wanted his party to win as many state Senate seats as possible. The more members of your party who vote, the more likely you are to win an election. The new lines were drawn to include loads of areas that would help Governor Jerry in the future. They were so strange looking that someone said the new districts look like a salamander. The Boston Gazette added Jerry's name to the word salamander, and voila, gerrymandering the process of dividing up and redrawing districts to give your political party an advantage. So how exactly does someone go about protecting their own political party and actually gerrymandering a district? There are two successful practices, packing a district and cracking a district. 
Packing is the process of drawing district lines and packing in your opponents like cattle into as few districts as possible. If more districts equals more votes, the fewer the districts there are, the fewer votes the opposition party will get. Packing, then, decreases the opponent's voter strength and influence. Cracking is the opposite, taking one district and cracking it into several pieces. This is usually done in districts where your opponent has many supporters. Cracking spreads these supporters out among many districts, denying your opponent a lot of votes. When you have a large number of people who will generally vote for one type of party, those folks are known as a voting bloc. Cracking is a way to break that all up. So when would a party choose to pack their opponent's districts rather than crack them? Well, that really depends on what the party needs. To dilute your opponent's voters, you could pack them into one district and leave the surrounding districts filled with voters of your own party. Or, if you and your party are in power when it's time to redraw district lines, you could redraw districts and crack up a powerful district and spread your opponent's voters out across several neighboring districts. So, Governor Jerry in 1812 wanted to gain an advantage for his party and redrew district lines in a state in such a crazy way, we have a whole new word and way of thinking about how political parties can gain advantages over their opponents. Politicians think of creative ways to draw districts every few years. So, the next time an election comes around and politicians ask people to vote, be sure to look up the shape of your district and the districts that surround it. How wide does your district stretch across your state? Are all the districts in your state relatively the same shape? How many other districts does your district touch? But always be sure to ask yourself, does my district look like a salamander? All right, so this video comes from Ted Ed, and if you had any trouble watching it or if the sound didn't come through, I will post the link in the lesson as well. So make sure that if you did have trouble, pause this video and go watch that one, all right? It is really important for what we're going to talk about. So we learned a little bit about the history of gerrymandering, and I want to talk a little bit more about how it works and why it works the way it does. So we're going to look, for example, at a state. We're going to pretend that this picture right here is a state that has 50 people inside of it. And when I start looking at this, I say, okay, what I notice is that I see three columns here that are blue, and I have two columns here that are red. So just by looking at this, I see that in this state, blue has a majority over red. And that's kind of what I see down here as well. 60% of people in this state are blue and 40% are red. So there are a couple of different ways that states have districts drawn in them. So what your district is, is it's a representation of who your representative represents. So when we talk about representation, we draw in these districts to make sure that everyone is represented. So the first picture right here is what we would call perfect representation. It means that when I look at each of our districts, each different, different district perfectly represents one group. So we see two red districts and we see three blue districts. When I look at this, this tells me that blue has the majority because they have three districts. And that kind of mirrors what we saw in this first place here. But also, when I look at perfect representation, I see that every voice is equally represented. So that means that in our first two columns here, since these are all red, they are going to elect someone red to represent them, whose voice matches their own. Since our next three columns are all blue, these three districts are going to elect someone who is blue, whose voice represents them. So this is called perfect representation, not only because of who is inside of it, but it shows that every single person is represented. And in this case, it would be three blue districts and two red districts, meaning that any time that we would talk about the majority, blue wins that majority. Now numbers two and three are examples of gerrymandering. They're just different types. Number two is an example of what is called compact but unfair gerrymandering. We still have the same amount of people in each uh, district, but what we see is that now, instead of drawing lines up and down, we've drawn lines left and right, and that each district has six blue voters and four blue voters. So that means that when I'm looking at each district here, the majority in every single district is blue. 
So that means when we're talking about voting, every single district is going to have blue representation, but we see that there is no red representation. This would be an example of gerrymandering that the blue side would do in order to ensure that blue would win. What happens is that the people who vote red, their voices aren't necessarily represented as much as the blue, because if in each district we have blue representation as the, major as the majority, the minority votes here just aren't going to be heard, as opposed to when we look at perfect representation, we see that in three of our columns, blue is represented, and in two of our columns, red is represented. So this is compact but unfair. And our third example of gerrymandering is what we would call neither compact nor fair. And this is actually very similar to what happens in a lot of states currently. So just visually looking at the difference between one, two, and three, three is kind of all over the place. You've got really wonky looking districts that are kind of all over the place. We see that they're separated over here and that some of them are just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. But when I look at these districts, what I notice is that one, two, three of these districts are drawn in such a way that red has a majority and blue does not have a majority. Blue only has a majority in these two long districts down here. What that means is that when we're counting votes, the, th the districts are three red districts to two, red, two blue districts. So this is an example of something that the red group would draw to make sure that their vote was heard more than the blue group. So what we would see is that in these top three, the blue group has four as opposed to the red group, which has six in each one. So what we see is that the red group has drawn the lines in such a way that they are in power as opposed to the blue group. So there are problems with both number two and number three. The only difference is who ends up winning. So number two would be an example of how blue would redraw to the districts to make themselves win. And three would be an example of how the red would redraw the districts to make themselves win. So what we see is that most states are drawn, their district lines are drawn in either two or three. We see very few states that actually have what is called perfect representation. So I wanna look at a map of North Carolina and talk about how this works. So this is uh, a map of North Carolina. We see three different ones. And this is talking about how gerrymandering can actually change an election. So when I look at the first map here, this is a Republican congressional map that was used in 2012 and 2004. When I look at this map, the first thing I see is that there's this really big, long, strange looking district here for District 12 that kind of branches out and touches all of these other districts. And when I look at one and four, they kind of do the same thing. So what I'm noticing is that they've stretched out all of this blue. So what this tells me is that when I look at this map here, it is majority red, meaning that 10 of the 13 districts of North Carolina are Republican districts when drawn this way. So this is an example of a Republican drawn map. The second map is what's called a hypothetical Democrat con congressional map. When something is hypothetical, it means that it's not real, it's proposed. And what I notice immediately when I look at the difference between these two maps is that there is so much more blue on this map. And it is still drawn a little funky, right? I'm still seeing a lot of funky lines. When I look at the ninth district here, it's very weird and blobby looking. And this third district has all of this piece down here. So what I'm seeing are these really odd looking districts, just like we saw in the districts that were drawn by Republicans. So when we change this map though, our second map shows us that nine of the 13 districts would vote blue and four would vote red. So what I wanna talk about here is that just by redrawing lines, we have an impact on who wins these elections and who actually is representing you. And the last map that we want to talk about is what's called a hypothetical nonpartisan congressional map. If something is nonpartisan, it means that it is not party specific. So this is a map that was drawn by someone who has no party affiliations, who has 
um, no care whether or not a Democrat wins or a Republican wins. And what I notice here is that there is another color that is given to me, the white color or this cream color. I also notice that in terms of districts, these look a little bit more contained. I don't see any more of these really long, weird looking districts. I see some very separate contained units. And what I'm noticing here is that five of the 13 states are Democratic, five of the 13 states are Republican, and three are what are called swing districts. So we talked a little bit about last week that a swing state is a state that would vote either Democrat or Republican, depending on the election. A swing district does the same thing, that there's a mixture of voters inside of those districts. So District 2, for example, is a swing district because it is a mixture of Democratic and Republican voters that are all centered together in one group, meaning that they could go either way, depending now I wanna take a minute and look at our district map. So this is a district map of Kentucky and a couple of things stand out to me. But before I tell you what stands out to me, I want you to go ahead and pause the video and take a really good look at this map. What are some things that you notice and what do they make you think about? So when I look at this map, there are a couple of things that stand out to me. The first is that when I look at Lexington here, I see that there are a couple of different districts that are partial districts like Jessamine County or like Harrison County. They're kind of cut off in the middle. The other thing I notice is that Louisville is kind of all by itself. It is just one county. And the third thing I notice is that there's this weird county down here, county number one, which is just kind of long and separated. So what I'm noticing is that there's evidence of gerrymandering in our state as well. Remember that gerrymandering is something that happens from both political parties. So this isn't something that just affects one group or the other. What we wanna talk about is how do we fix this? So when we wanna talk about fixing gerrymandering, it can be changed every 10 years when the census is redone. So 2020 happens to also be a year when the census has come out. Hopefully you have already filled out your census. And what that does is it changes the population data. When we change population data, if we have more people that live here, we need to redraw our district lines. And what we've noticed is that historically, whenever we redraw district lines, whichever party happens to be in charge redraws those lines for their favor. So if we do have to redraw our lines, I just encourage you to call your Congress people and your senators to try to make sure that they know that gerrymandering doesn't really help anyone. And it actually means that everyone's voice is heard a little less equally. So I know that today we've talked a lot about all of these modern things that are happening to suppress the vote. So my last question is always, what can I do? How can I protect my vote? It's really important that people vote and it's because we want to have a say in our government. It's so important that your voice gets heard. Our government shouldn't be shaping us, we should be shaping our government. So what you can do first and foremost is know your rights. Know what you need to do to be able to vote. Know what you need to do to stay involved and who to contact if you have questions or concerns about how the government is running. If you want to see change happen, you can encourage Kentucky to allow automatic online same-day registration. That means that no matter who you are or what political affiliations you have, when you turn 18, you are automatically registered to vote. And if for some reason that doesn't happen, you can register online and the same day that you vote. We also want to encourage Kentucky to allow early voting. So this year is a little bit different because of the coronavirus pandemic, but normally early voting is not something that is allowed. So we want to really encourage Kentucky to continue using early voting since Election day is not a holiday. It's harder to get to the polls if you have to work all day. And the last thing we want to talk about is encouraging Kentucky to enforce the protections from the Voting Rights Act. We know that the Voting Rights Act what happened in the 1960s as a direct result of the civil rights movement that really pushed to make sure that everyone's voice was heard and that everyone had the ability to vote, not just the right. So we want that enforcement to happen across the board. 
And the last thing we can do is get involved. You can call your senators. You can call your Congress people. And really, you want to ask them to pass what's called the Voting Rights Advancement Act. This is something that is in the Senate right now. And what it does is that it helps to fill in the gaps left behind from new regulations and oversights. So these are things like helping to clear up voter registration, helping to make specific rules about what you do when you are trying to clear and clean up voter rolls, um, and just making sure that when we talk about voting, we just make it overall as easy as possible. Because right now our voting process is actually kind of hard. And what it means is that a lot of us feel like our voices aren't heard. I get that. The best thing we can do is to just keep pushing and keep encouraging our government to work for us, not the other way around. We don't work for our government. Our government is supposed to work for us. So this week we had a lot of homework assignments that we want to get on top of. So make sure you're checking in on Google Classroom. On Monday, your vocabulary words have been posted on Quizlet. For Tuesday, we have more reading skills practice that are going to be focusing again on inference. So they're asking us to continue making those educated guesses. Make sure you have your notes on inference before you try your homework assignment. And if you haven't watched the video on making inferences, make sure you go do that before you try this assignment out. On Wednesday, we're learning a new grammar skill. We're going to be focusing on fragments versus complete sentences and how to tell the difference between them. On Thursday, we have a close reading activity that goes along with what we were talking about today that talks about what America would look like if we didn't have gerrymandering and how everyone's voices would be heard. And then on Friday, we are going to do an introduction to circle graphs. So there are only three questions that are there, but I'm going to ask that you try them out and we'll continue with working circle graphs over the next couple of weeks. All right, everybody, good luck with your homework. If you have any questions, if you want to talk about voting or voter rights, or if you want any more information on the stuff that we've talked, to, to, talked about today, just send me a message and I will talk to you soon. Have a great week, everyone.